economic growth. And uh, speaking first is Marilyn Brown. Uh, she's uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, although she spent many years at Oak Ridge. Uh, and, and most recently, she's been confirmed as a member of the TVA board. So I think she can speak to today's topic from at least three, possibly more, to, more angles. Uh, thank you, Tom. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, energy policy and social behavioral issues uh, that influence consumer choices. So um, this is first starting with this notion that uh, we're trying with our various energy bills to create a level playing field. We're not quite there, uh, but we're making progress, I, I think. On the um, so contextual frame, some of the work that I've done with the National Academies of America's Climate Choices resulted in this recommendation that the United States needs to adopt a cumulative greenhouse gas emissions budget in order to um, put into perspective the full slate of a 45-year planning horizon so that what you do today and, and next year um, can be appraise with respect to the trade-offs in future years if you want to do uh, um, over uh, if you want to overreach your goals early on you're going to have to really dig deep to uh, make it up in the future and uh, if in fact business as usual continues this budget of about 170 to 200 gigatons for the globe of carbon not co2 I'm sorry of co2 equivalent um, if we continue with our current uh, emissions levels, we'll have consumed this budget entirely within about 25 to 30 years. I like this diagram from Rob Sokolow, who's also on the America's Climate Choices Committee. He uh, has put into perspective here where we are today in the U.S. with uh, 20 um, tons of CO2 per capita on an annual basis relative to, and these colors include Russia red and blue is the U and off to the um, little purple around the four is China and then we have India, the light blue and the purple off to the right is Africa. You might remember that um, Steve Coonan said if everyone consumed energy like we do or everyone emitted CO2 like we do, there would be seven times the emissions um, in the globe. And that's related to this 20 for the U.S. versus four, which is the global average of tons per, of CO2 per capita per year. So that's where we stand. That's the kind of eye-opening um, frame to uh, help us understand the magnitude of the effort that's ahead of us. And we all know that if we invest in R&D and it's successful, that we can bring down the costs of making those adjustments over the, the next uh, 50 years or century. Um, the availability of advanced technologies can greatly reduce the cost of CO2 mitigation. And in evaluating all of the various technology opportunities, the America's Energy Futures uh, Committee of the uh, National Academies, again, another committee of the National Academies, concluded that energy efficiency is the fastest, cheapest, cleanest approach, and estimated that over the next 20 years, the United States could easily reduce 30% of its energy consumption or CO2 emissions without great cost, with little cost, and not contingent on miracles in the laboratory, but just with the incremental improvement of known technologies. So I want to focus most of my attention on the um, opportunity we have in this country to improve the energy efficiency uh, of our economy. The U.S. energy system is highly inefficient. These are some calculations, again, that um, we did looking at the current efficiency of the electric utility industry. If you combine the efficiency of the power plant times the transmission line losses times the uh, typical loss for a, an incandescent light bulb, then you'd have to conclude that the energy embodied in that lump of coal used to power that um, pulverized coal plant was uh, producing only uh, one 
0.3% uh, of useful energy in the end, 1.3% overall efficiency. Now, a lot of the reason for our um, overwhelmingly inefficient energy system is the existence of a variety of barriers and constraints, obstacles, sometimes people call them market failures, I think they go beyond that. Um, and many of these were itemized in this Department of Energy report called Strategies for the Commercialization and Deployment of et cetera, not, not known for its short titles. <laughs> but you can find this great report at uh, climatetechnologies.gov, which is the website that Bob Marley has created. He was here earlier today. He spent, he spent the morning with us. And so, as well as many other great uh, reports that I'd, uh, I think you would find to, to be useful. And um, all, coming out of this report, I published an article in a law journal, which is one of my favorite publications. It's called Governing Confusion. And what it does is to itemize all of the um, all of the uh, rules, regulations, policies, incentives, and other legal and policy um, um, uh, contexts within which the, uh, we see uh, clean energy technologies having to fight against. <laughs> it was poorly stated, sorry about that. <laughs> all the inhibiting laws and regulations. Um, and here are a couple of them. It was mentioned earlier that our state building codes are uh, really a chaotic kind of picture of, uh, of variable um, requirements. So less than half of the states in the U.S. have codes for residential new construction that are um, either from the year 2006 or more recent. So there was a code passed in 2006 by the International Energy Conservation Code, IECC, and about half the states have adopted it or something more recent. That means about half the states have something more historic. In fact, about 10 states have no codes. <laughs> And if you look at net metering, so now we're talking about the uh, rules and regulations that are in place which control how much power that a consumer that creates electricity on their site can uh, sell back to the utility. You'll see that about 40 uh, states are green. They have uh, some form of a state policy enabling net metering. But if you look at the numbers, if you can uh, see them, they're rather small, but you'll notice that some are small and some are large. For instance, in the state of the great state of Georgia, um, the utility there, the um, investor-owned utility, Georgia Power, allows customers to sell back up to 10 kilowatts for uh, residential building and up to 100 kilowatts for a large commercial or industrial customer. Those are such small numbers that it's actually essentially a prohibition against large commercial buildings or any industrial um, sellback. So combined heat and power or some form of district heating and, and uh, uh, cooling with the power production which usually runs in the uh, megawatt scale for power generation, is not able to get any credit to, uh, when selling back to a utility in the states that have these small caps. So we have a very variable and highly limiting net metering laws. We also have um, uh, something which is often called uh, electricity coupling in most states. There are only about nine states that have decoupling, but in most states we have a coupling of utility profits to electricity sales. And that is a, the um, regulatory uh, authorities that, um, that oversee the uh, rules for return on investment by electric uh, utilities typically do some form of return which is based on a multiplication of their sales. Now, why is that? I mean, perhaps that just seems logical, and <laughs> why not? Well, if you're trying to promote the utility as an ambassador for energy efficiency, where the utility is selling energy services, not just power, but they're trying to sell to you the means for you to have heating, cooling, and light, 
then you want to reward them for investments in anything which helps deliver an energy service. And if the utility uh, return on investment is tied only to sales, then they are going to have a built-in motivation to sell more and to oppose um, programs to uh, promote energy efficiency. So, you know, states are laboratories of democracy. It's wonderful that they do uh, try different experiments with policies and indeed a lot of the best policies that have gone nationwide in this country have started off in some state. However, in the case of energy policy, it's now an inhibitor to a smooth operating national market for new clean technologies. Um, we talked earlier, I think it was uh, maybe Steve Coonan again, who talked about the on-again, off-again production tax credit, were highly variable over time, or well, we had this geographic variability also that uh, hurts the growth of, of uh, green techs. So in some states, such as California and New York, the state uh, policies have been extremely uh, effective, and you can see this in the results in terms of uh, electricity consumption per capita over time. So it's essentially in California been flat since the early 70s, and New York uh, caught up and plateaued in the 80s with their, with their policies. Well, what about the rest of the country? Well, um, in the South, where we have very few policies, I don't know if you, like me, I always focus on the South when I see these maps of where the good and the evil, <laughs> where the better and the worst <laughs> policies are. A lot of this, the Southern policies don't, uh, don't provide much support for, for clean technology. So we did a, an estimate of what it would, uh, how much uh, reduction in energy consumption could occur um, that could be judged to be cost effective, where the net present value um, is favorable. And we concluded that essentially the energy consumption of the South could remain flat if a series of residential, commercial, and industrial sector programs were to be implemented to encourage investments of efficiency in those, uh, in those sectors. And using uh, input-output analysis, we were able to calculate the estimate in increased, your estimated impact on employment, which is a net impact. We're tallying up the jobs in those um, sectors of the economy that support efficiency, such as construction and the manufacturing of uh, new motors and drive systems, et cetera. And then you remove from that total um, increase the decrease in jobs in the power sector and in uh, natural gas production, which you're displacing. Now, keep in mind that in terms of construction and manufacturing, the ratio of jobs to million dollars spent is about three to one, where the one is the number of jobs that you get when you invest in the production of, of electricity or natural gas production. So that's the rationale behind why it is that we're able to estimate that this uh, potential for electricity and energy uh, conservation or efficiency could generate so many jobs here, 380,000 in the year 2020 and and 520,000 in the year 2030. So the historic um, focus of environmental energy um, policy in this country has been to regulate industry. Since the explosion of environmental uh, regulation, that's, that's been the regulatory prescription. Let's look at large industrial emitters and let's, let's regulate them. So um, as a result, when you turn to the con more consumer-oriented markets, we, al we also see this pattern where uh, auto emissions are controlled principally by regulations that influence what manufacturers can put on the market, the CAFE standards, or in the case of residential electricity, it's by regulating the building industry, such as codes and standards, or rate reform for utilities. Um, but... Consumers are increasingly the driving force 
of energy and carbon decisions. There's a growing body of evidence that it's not the titans of industry now whose decisions are determining the bottom line energy and carbon emissions. It's more what we do. We're voting with our feet. We walk to the malls <laughs> and we walk to the, shop, to the voting booth. It's what we're doing that's driving the energy and, and carbon complex. And these were a couple of articles that I like that have some estimates of what it is that the consumer is, is, is really in the uh, driver's seat for. And then more recently, last year, there was an article by Tom Dietz from Michigan State and some other people you may know um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which said that we have a behavioral wedge available to us. So now we're talking about the Rob Sokolow and Stephen Piccolo wedges. You know, divide the um, growth of global carbon emissions that are seen as going from 8 to 16 gigatons over the next 50 years. That gives us the need for at least 8 gigatons of reduction if we keep, want to keep that flat. Of course, we want to do more. And then they're saying one of these uh, wedges could be derived from behavioral um, uh, changes, which would occur with very little lifestyle um, reform. So we took this uh, as a challenge, to see what we could do in um, the residential housing market, revisit this uh, notion of the existence of an energy efficiency gap, which, uh, by the way, is a term that Eric Hurst and I coined, first to be published about 15, 20 years ago. Um, does it still exist? And if so, why does it exist? And then um, we were asked also to look at promising policies based on the evidence of the type of behavioral and social uh, barriers that are preventing that gap from being exploited. If consumers were rational, after all, they would adopt energy efficient technologies and practices assuming everything else was equal because it saves you money and opens up prospects for spending that money in ways you might prefer. Consumers would always choose the more efficient product, all other things being equal. And then responding to that consumer choice, we would have suppliers um, following uh, that demand. But in fact, there are a whole a range of um, social and behavioral barriers that prevent that logical um, decision-making from occurring. And three of them that we chose to look at were deliberation costs, um, that is the, the fact that often making a selection of a, a product in the marketplace can be very complicated, and so we typically cut through that through the use of various heuristics, like copying other people. People say that the um, first principle of behavioral economics is copying, <laughs> defaulting to the status quo, or a heuristic like your favorite uh, brand product. Uh, aversion to losses, people, um, and David Green has been uh, looking at this. David, raise your hand in case people want to question you later. <laughs> He's been looking that, at, at that. Uh, the literature says there is uh, orientation, a ratio of about two to one when comparing the consumer's um, aversion to loss versus attraction for profit. <laughs> they would much rather uh, avoid that failure and it has something to do with sunk costs where you've already invested so much and you don't want to have been wrong and you know that kind of uh, logic. And then there's past experience where people get um, put much greater weight on options that are grounded in recent experience where the information is personalized. Um, so we took a, a look at an array of policies that we thought were well matched to those three behavioral le levers. And the uh, result was um, some analysis of mandatory disclosure of home energy performance. We heard a little bit about that this morning. Uh, On-bill financing, which is where utilities uh, finance the uh, upgrade for you, and then smart meters. So I've got just a few brief remarks on each of these. So smart meters, uh, this is not a Google power meter, but it could be. As Dan Riker says, uh, knowledge uh, is power or less power in this case. <laughs> so we have uh, the ability to cut through that 
issue of, of uh, experience, past experience being the driver. It's got to be personalized. It's got to be immediate. And you need to have that information uh, combined with pricing information, which is most effective, of course, if it's dynamic pricing, because the real cost of electricity can vary by a ratio of 10 to 1 uh, any day of the year. And so we need to help make the marketplace responsive to that and allow us to be efficient res um, in response to the real cost of electricity. And then we have the mandated disclosure of energy performance information at point of sale or lease of a property. So this has sometimes been debated as just putting, say, a year of utility bill information on the, um, on the uh, multiple listing service ad, but it could also be a HERS rating or an energy um, performance uh, rating of any sort. In uh, the state of Texas, my friend Malcolm Verdict, who runs a program there, has gotten the HERS rating down to the cost of about 250 per house. So uh, clearly would um, pay back quickly. Evidence in Australia, where they have a six-star system of rating already imposed on um, the exchange of properties, each star gives you a 3% increase in house value at the point of sale. So uh, could, could easily pay back and gives you that information helps cut through that deliberation cost. And then on bill financing addre addresses that risk aversion by mainstreaming the retrofit financing, overcomes that cash flow barrier. Loans are made by the utility and the, um, uh, the amount of the increase in repayment is set to be uh, no more than the energy cost that's saved. <laughs> where's, where's Bob Shelton, those negative savings? <laughs> Um, so, so those are three types of programs, and of course, we did this uh, without the benefit of a major R&D initiative and social and behavioral um, research on energy. Uh, such an initiative is sorely needed so that our policies can be better grounded. So I'd like to leave with some grounds for optimism. Um, Carbon emissions have just begun to be, pr to be priced. <coughs> Market signals are going to begin to, s where did I get that, have begun to be priced? <laughs> uh, in parts of the world, in some regions of the United States, <laughs> carbon emissions are beginning to be priced. And market signals, uh, therefore, will spur innovation. Uh, most of the capital infrastructure that we're going to have by the year 2050 is still to be built, so we still have a chance to do it right. Our current energy system could be made much more efficient, as you saw from my one diagram, creating jobs, reducing imports. And uh, however, we do need to know if the price of the cost of achieving those behavioral changes are affordable and acceptable. And if engaging in a very active program of social marketing is uh, going to be acceptable to the citizenry of this country. Thank you very much. OK. Next panelist is Michael Toman. He's the lead economist on climate change in the Development Research Group and manager of the Energy and Environment Team at the World Bank. His research interests include alternative energy resources, policies for responding to risks of climate change catastrophes, timing of investments for greenhouse gas reduction, and mechanisms for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions through reduced deforestation. During his career, he's done extensive research on climate change economics and policy, energy markets and policy, environmental policy instruments and approaches to achieving sustainable development. Thanks. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint. I just have <clears throat> some notes here to keep me from saying something uh, really dumb. Um, I do want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I particularly want to thank Bob Shelton for reaching out to me and uh, inviting me. It's been a, a great pleasure to be able to be a part of this opening session. As I've, uh, or opening day, I should say, of what will be several sessions. 
as I've listened to the discussions throughout the day, I've uh, begun to realize that um, I may be a little bit of an outlier here, uh, not so much because of the things in economics and energy I've done, but because of my current job at the World Bank. Um, I would like to talk about that roughly 80 percent of the world's population that several earlier uh, presenters have emphasized will actually end up determining where things go in the long run on a lot of different bases, be it uh, patterns of energy and carbon uh, emissions or lots of other, uh, lots of other factors. Um, I work currently in the research department in the World Bank. Uh, I should say, by the way, that uh, whether it's smart or stupid, whatever I say today is my own views alone and not anybody else's at the bank. Um, you probably know, at least in some version, that you know, the bank's job is to promote sustained and sustainable improvements in livelihoods to reduce poverty, and it's not just about economic growth in the conventional sense. And actually, there continues to be work in the research department on measuring intangibles associated with depleting natural capital and valuing ecosystem services and some of these other things. We're actually continuing to try to think about what might be done with greening national accounts or at least using that information for evaluating country programs and country strategies. The bank has a lot of things that it's doing these days in uh, the energy, climate change, environment arena. I won't even begin to try to enumerate them for uh, risk of real boredom. But um, there is a lot that goes on in terms of promoting investment in uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency efforts to try to improve water resource management. Um, the bank is not only a technical assistance and investment entity in itself, but also is a trustee of several international uh, donor funds that are uh, deployed for various purposes related to mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Um, I would like to now sort of get maybe to the point, which is to say the topic in this session, particularly looking at science, society, and sustainability, coincidentally happens to tie fairly nicely to an effort that has been going through a crescendo at the bank for about a year, year and a half now an increasing realization that we can and should do better in the bank in both uh, gathering knowledge to help improve performance and organizing the knowledge we do have so that we don't end up making the same mistakes more than once or wasting time and energy to find the same solutions. This has led to a lot of mind-numbing bureaucratic documents, but the good news is the less mind-numbing thing will be that President Zelik is giving a what's billed as a major address, always frightens me when I hear that because it sounds like something that is advertised on TV, but he's giving a speech tomorrow at Georgetown University in which he's going to be talking about the role that research uh, plays, scientific research writ large, in making the bank work better and in getting better development outcomes. So there's a lot of room for improvement um, in what we do, but we are, I think, really beginning to get very active now in seeing how science and knowledge can play a role and not just sort of, you know, stamping out things the way we've always done. Um, one of the things that I think is also very important for thinking about the problems of developing countries, no doubt the U.S. and the EU as well, but particularly in developing countries, the science part of it is important, of course, but so is the society part. It really is very difficult and often very foolhardy to try to operate a science program to improve what you do in investing and building capacity and then try to understand what's going on in the society and its needs and then suddenly have them sort of stumble over each other in the middle of the night and realize, gee, we didn't do a very good job at that. I'll try to give a few examples going through here of what I mean by that, the fact that we've got to do a better job, uh, all of us involved in development uh, analysis and practice to integrate what we know and what we need to know about the way societies operate in developing countries and what they need from an engineering, science, and technology point of view. So what kind of conversations might you find if you were the, the fly on the wall in, in a ministerial office somewhere in a developing country that would have to do with science? Well, uh, I don't pretend that this is a definitive list, of course, but you might hear things along the following general lines. How can science help us address very basic, very current problems that we have? 
you know, we really are trying to deal with things that are not just from a political point of view short term, they're actually from a very operational point of view short term. We're, we're, we're sort of always flirting with uh, at least small scale disaster and we really need to see how we can get something out of science now as well as using it for longer term gains. Um, you might, if you were a visiting delegation of scientists, uh, be asked, do you understand the institutional and social context in which we operate here and not just the technological? Do you know how our society and our economy work, not just about the you know, nature of our uh, electricity system? Um, are you asking the right questions that we need to ask and are you going about trying to answer them in that sense of having them in the proper context? Is what you're proposing for scientific investigation or application of science, is it pitched correctly, meaning is it at the scale and the complexity that makes sense for us as the clients or the recipients? Um, we have constraints on our own scientific abilities, our own resources, human and otherwise. There's only so much we can do to assimilate new ideas. Um, are you taking that into account? Um, we here in this developing country, we have certainly a substantial amount of illiteracy, unfortunately, and we have ignorance. What we may have is less of what some of the discussion this morning pointed at, which, pick your adjectives, I happen to pick foolishness and narcissism, the things that often seem to characterize these very corrosive debates we have about what is and isn't good science. Um, a lot of what goes on in developing countries certainly can have that flavor if it has to do with uh, somebody in a position of power who's trying to protect that. Uh, they're as skilled at that game as anybody, but a lot of it is just because people don't know and they don't even know that they don't know. That's a very different context in which science operates and science can, can make a con contribution. Is this going to be sort of helicopter drop science? Are you going to come in and, you know, do a workshop, solve a problem, build a, a research center and leave, or is this going to make some more systemic and lasting improvement with things that can have, you know, longer legs than just the, the one-off? Um, now, um, so where does that lead me at least in terms of thinking about some answers to that question? Well, we use that phrase sustainability a lot in a, in a lot of different conversations. It doesn't mean the same thing in poor countries as it does in rich countries. It may not mean something completely different, but it doesn't mean the same. It doesn't mean trying just trying to figure out where we might be in 2050 or 2100 and what the state of the global environment will be. It also means whether we're going to be able to avert famine in the next 10 years or whether we're going to be able to deal with any number of other uh, environmental and social challenges that you all know at least you know, something about. Um, another question is, do we need to do something new or can we just modify or improve the utilization or implementation of things that we already know today? Um, the debate about appropriate technology, I think, you know, spent about two decades taking us off track in a way because it divided the debate up into two opposing camps, neither of which were really right. Um, we should take stock of what we know and figure out if we can use it before we go out and build something new. But unfortunately, whether it's investments at the World Bank or other kinds of programs, we sometimes forget that in the interest of bringing something new and fresh and innovative to the table. Sometimes old and not fresh and boring can really work well if you figure out how to make it work. Um, facts don't solve problems. Maybe that's true everywhere, but it's certainly true in developing countries. What solve problems are the responses that people make to new knowledge and, and new lessons and, and new ideas and even new, you know, uh, vehement arguments. Uh, we have to therefore understand what's motivating people's behavior, um, including very much the kind of things um, that Marilyn's mentioned with behavioral economics and some of the uh, ways that we can now see that people, uh, rich or poor, are more complicated decision makers than we used to pretend they were in our, in our classroom theories. Um, do we understand the political economy influences that would make it difficult to have seemingly obvious self-improving things occur because, well, no, for some important people it doesn't make them better off and we can't figure out how to either deflect or buy off that resistance. Do we understand very basic things about how you can construct uh, supply chains for new technology, put in place the necessary human capacity? Um, uh, 
the energy program within the bank in various guises over the years has done a lot of studies about why it is that seemingly very sound renewable energy technologies haven't done as we would have liked to have seen them done. And very often it's not because they were bad technologies. No, it was because we hadn't really gotten the institutional model right for making sure that somebody would be there to fix it, somebody would be there to securitize the asset, that somebody could make it affordable and, and things of that nature. There's a very substantial body of knowledge on that now. Uh, another observation. Uh, all of us, and certainly uh, people at the bank are no different, we face a lot of difficult choices to make under time and resource constraints. And it's easy then to see a few good examples and say, that's the answer. And we just have to go back to our first undergraduate statistics class and say those two you know, d very distressing magic words, selection bias. There's so many times that I see, and I see researchers, myself included, falling into the trap as well. On the basis of a few very promising um, examples, we think we found a general solution, and it's rarely, if ever, that easy. So it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer, and yet we don't seem to have the ability to keep that in mind, because we all want it to be better, and we get overrun by our own desire, I think, to, to make it better. Um, so uh, we have to be thoughtful about not jumping in too quickly. Um, and we have to be realistic that sometimes there are really difficult trade-offs. So now let me stop uh, sermonizing maybe a little bit and say something a little more concrete about climate change issues where I do spend a fair amount of my you know, daily life and, and my work. Um, before I talk about some of the things that have been of great interest and focus in many of the other presentations today, I want to talk about um, something that I've called here little orphan adaptation. Um, this is, I think, something that has been very uh, vexing for poor countries and certainly for their um, uh, champions and others in um, international organizations and in rich countries. Um, we have, for very understandable reasons, so much focus on decarbonization. Um, improving the way that we can use energy to produce the same economic uh, benefits and, and well-being with less harm to the environment, all clearly important, crucial. Um, what then tends to get lost is that we're already committed to a degree of climate change. Um, we don't know yet how serious the amount to which we're already committed is going to be, but there's certainly some signs that it's not going to be, you know, a, a simple, you know, ride on a lake. Could be more like going over a small waterfall, and it's likely only going to get worse. Um, if, as Maryland statistics indicate, you know, we have to act quickly, and that doesn't seem to be something that we're yet entirely prepared to do. So. We focus on mitigation in our international debates, in our bilateral assistance programs. Um, we focus on economic growth advice in other parts of our activities for supporting development in developing countries. And we tend to leave out adaptation or it gets sort of an afterthought. And that's, I think, just wrong. It's wrong operationally. It's wrong economically. And I think it's actually wrong um, uh, ethically as well. These countries are already uh, going to face problems that were largely created by people in wealthy countries, or wealthy people in not wealthy countries, if you will. And we have to do what we are able to put the means in their hands to do better. And so we've got to find a way to raise adaptation up to the level of attention that now is almost second nature for us in the mitigation debate, or else that 80% really aren't getting their most immediate needs addressed, and I don't happen to think that's a, a good way to go. Now, adaptation benefits are usually seen as being national. They're not global like mitigating emissions. So they do tend to get somewhat shorter shrift in international negotiations. But there are also a lot of what economists love to call spillover effects associated with adaptation that really mean you've got to have government involvement and international cooperation. As much as we think we can identify ways in which uh, with uh, information with some um, em empowering options for technology and the like that individuals can adapt and do adapt. We have evidence to that. It won't be enough. And so there has to be a public role and a policy role for adaptation. 
But the dividing line between adaptation and just plain old good development is pretty fuzzy sometimes. So it's hard to articulate what the framework is for improving resilience. You know, we can talk about the framework convention for climate change, parentheses, mitigation, though that isn't what it was called. It would be harder, I think, if it was 1990 and we were starting over again to say what the framework convention on climate change adaptation would be, because it's murky. It's hard to distinguish from what we're trying to do anyway to get countries to develop better. Um, we have to, as well, recognize that if governments could make their development initiatives and uh, perform better, the adaptation urgency would also be lower. But if we knew how to solve that problem, we'd have solved a lot of problems that we haven't already solved, at least since 1947. So the question of why we aren't able to organize development initiatives to be as effective as we'd like to be is a question that overhangs the current adaptation debate and makes it a really politically charged thing in ways that I'm not sure are much different than the political charge surrounding mitigation, but maybe just a little less visible. So um, what would that suggest then if we're trying to think about some scientific endeavor looking forward over the, the life of this, this uh, initiative that would be interesting and useful for helping poor countries to enhance their resilience? Well, some things seem fairly obvious, and we have research. We even have you know, pilot programs or full-blown programs operating. We should try to provide better public health because we know that one of the effects of climate change is going to be more threat to or stress on public health. Uh, we need to be able to do better at managing water resources, more robust measures for doing that in the face of more extreme events and more uncertainty. We need to be able to uh, have better disaster warning systems, but also we need to be much more skillful in the way we address uncertainty in our hard and soft protection measures. Not so obvious might be things like the following. Uh, one of my colleagues did a wonderful study on how you could promote reduction to uh, mortality risk in the face of growing extreme events in the coastal areas of Bangladesh. Turned out, and I wouldn't have guessed this, but she's from uh, West Bengal, so it wasn't so surprising to her, people don't want to leave their livestock behind when there's a big storm coming because it's the major part of their family wealth. And the shelters aren't built large enough to hold the livestock as well as the people. So faced with the Hobson's choice, they stay with the livestock and they drown. When you start building larger shelters, in, uh, you get lower mortality and you protect wealth as well as, as lives. Not very expensive, actually, to make the building a little bigger, but for whatever reason, that hadn't been thought of as something to do routinely. Um, what about incentives to adopt more water-conserving technologies? We'd love to see it happen. We still don't seem to have awfully good ways of trying to produce that result, at least ways that are both effective and politically palatable. Um, we talk about the need to invest in clean water, and we're still learning, and I think we've made progress, but we're still learning how to get individual behaviors to be as health protecting as our, our larger physical infrastructure investments. A couple of words on mitigation. Um, we have to make access to clean and affordable energy a top priority. Depending on who's doing the counting, we have 1.4, 1.5, 1.6 billion people in the world still that don't have routine access, in many cases no access at all, to modern energy. They use batteries or kerosene or, or wood fires for lighting such as it is. They cook over open stoves. The problems of indoor pollution for women and children are both dreadful and you know, well, well documented. We know from a lot of field experience that renewables are going to be a good choice for doing that in many, many cases. We also know that they're not always the best choice. And so we find sometimes that there's a concern about what happens if we start providing greater energy access, but it is somehow not as low carbon as it could be or, or, or close to no, no net carbon emissions. Well, as far as I can tell, looking at the numbers, even if much of that missing energy service was accomplished through realistic fossil measures, LPG, for example, or um, the like, any increase in greenhouse gases from that would be completely swamped by what happens to growth in 
vehicle demand in East and South Asia in the next 10 or 15 years, roughly speaking. So if access to clean and affordable energy is a priority, it's an example of where we want to make sure we keep our eye on what the priority is. It would be great to have all of this be renewable energy, but if that's not affordable, given current technology, and, and nobody is standing by ready to pay the difference, I'd rather see them have the energy. Uh, there's no doubt that what that does for the quality of life and livelihood is almost unimaginable unless you happen yourself to grow up in a situation where you didn't have that as a younger person. One of the great things about Alan Caneza when we had him still with us at Resources for the Future is he actually grew up in East Texas before electricity arrived in the 1930s and he used to talk about what that was like. It's pretty revealing to think that not so long ago there were major parts of rural U.S. that didn't have electricity and what a transforming event it was. Um, improved energy efficiency is uh, certainly important all over the world, including in poor countries, as well as in the U.S. and other rich countries. Um, some opportunities to improve will be both rich now but not necessarily lasting. The more cities start to you know, harden up their urban form and be sprawling metropolises, the harder it is then to go back and try to belatedly recover a lower uh, carbon footprint municipal transportation system. Um, Africa, I'm told by my colleagues, is one of the next big frontiers in this. The implication being that in many other areas, a lot of the cities are going to be harder to change because they've already moved down a road that isn't necessarily the best one for both economic and, and environmental uh, objectives. Um, Cities are going through enormous changes in their building stock. Growth in incomes uh, is producing major uptake in the use of electricity consuming appliances. How do we try to accent the positives in all that and, and deflect the negatives so that we can really encourage growth and at the same time not have growth be uh, very avoidably excess carbon? When I was in, in South Africa about three months ago, uh, people there in the bank's office were talking about how little solar hot water heating there was in South Africa, despite the fact that, as, as they told me at least, it was technologically perfectly reasonable to do. You could make a real go of it, just putting the you know, standard sort of device on your roof. Israel apparently has this on 100% of their houses. Virtually nobody does. And they said, we don't know why this is the case, because here we are trying to recover from our apartheid legacy rebuild all the shanty towns, try to provide decent uh, housing for people. We don't seem to be doing enough to mainstream a simple energy efficiency initiative like that into these uh, urban or peri-urban development programs. Oh, and by the way, these aren't very hard to build, and we have a 30 percent unemployment rate. Classic missing opportunity. Why aren't we doing better at that? I can't answer that, but I think it's a question we need to ask a lot more often. Um, Several people have noted that there's a lot that can be done here with regulation, uh, standards of different types. Um, notwithstanding my economics pedigree, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think it's high time that we were willing to combine the best of the price system and regulation to proceed with this. Uh, it's one of those cases where there's a very asymmetric cost of being wrong, so I'd rather we be a little wrong in, in over encouraging energy efficiency because I'm not sure we'll ever find that we've overdone it. Um, how do we get people to uh, bear the costs and risks of new renewable technology? Something I've encountered since being at the bank, quite surprising to me. A number of our client countries, for various reasons, are very interested in feed-in tariffs. Um, so I asked a few of the project developers, well, this is going to make your lower income population pay more for electricity. Why do you want to do that? Why don't you want to have more of the cost and uh, uh, risk borne either by the domestic suppliers or by the international community through some kind of uh, shared investment in buying down the cost of renewables or something else that would provide partial support if you're trying to you know, grow through the valley of death. But you're just saying the beginning and end of your policy is a feed-in tariff. And there's never really been a very clear answer to that. And I think it's something we need to be asking ourselves more often. Are we putting the costs and risk where they should go when we think about clean energy development in developing countries? Sometimes I'm sure the answer is yes, but I'm not sure it's as consistently 
positive as, as it could and should be. Uh, green jobs and the green economy. Um, uh, comments were made by Tim Worth earlier about being careful not to oversell that, and I, I tend to agree with that. Particularly in developing countries, nothing is ever as cheap as it may seem to be on paper. Uh, there are real challenges in getting over some of these regulatory barriers. And there are questions about how quickly and how plentifully the alternative jobs can be delivered. I don't have any doubt that the, the numbers that one can calculate will stand up to scrutiny as a long-run possibility, but we do need to be able to more consistently demonstrate that these things can be beneficial for countries like South Africa that have these huge unemployment and associated social problems, as well as producing a longer-term green growth track that could be beneficial. Um, so science again. For all the attention that we should be paying and more that we should be paying to energy technology development of various flavors, you all know that better than I do, we have to also figure out how we're going to be able to overcome the societal, the psychological, and other systemic barriers, including these political economy issues. How, for example, when the G20 says, we'd like to see energy subsidies um, phased out, do you then say to poor people, who may only be getting a little bit of the benefit, by the way, but they're still getting some, we want you to pay more for energy. Well, theoretically, we find some other way to compensate them. There are very, very few examples in any sphere, including energy, where we've really had success in doing that. And poor people aren't stupid. They're just poor. They understand how unreliable these promises can be. So that's something we really need to, to work on. Um, economics tells us don't pick winners. Um, I guess I've learned now since being at the World Bank, don't pick winners unless you have to. You know, we have to be very flexible about this, uh, not be doctrinaire. So um, I'd like to stop there, but with two last observations. One is to recap what I said at the beginning. I, I think there's tremendous promise in this initiative, and I hope as the initiative develops further, even if it stays as it's now configured a, a US-EU-focused initiative, because of, uh, as the first speaker pointed out, how much of the knowledge, science, and research capacity are found in those countries, there's also ways to expand the scope of it in order to deal with some of these problems that I think are uh, vitally important for our partners. They're not just them, as President Obama said in another context. It's sort of us, too, you know. Uh, they're in this with us. And I also hope that we can perhaps, as we go forward in the political discourse on these issues, be a little less optimistic about what we can accomplish if we can just produce, you know, one more convincing talk or one more um, powerful educational campaign. I actually think that we're going to lose the fight over the need to address climate change or the need to get smarter and more um, businesslike about development if we um, are too deferential. There's sometimes when you just have to stand up and say, sorry, you're a liar. I'm sorry, you're wrong. Sorry, you're just saying that to serve your own interests. And I think we have to find civil but blunt ways to call out people when they're saying things that just make absolutely no sense. And that's, I think, true in the U.S. debate about uh, climate change, where I have spent a little time in my career. It's also true when we try to figure out how to deal with failed states or fragile states in international development. The, the, the unwillingness sometimes to just call it as it is, I think, doesn't do any of us a favor in the long run. So. I think what's interesting about this initiative is the chance to not only bring very smart people together, but also figure out some communication strategies that are rich in content, but also perhaps, you know, can pack a wall up. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Pierre Vallette, who's the head of the Economic, Social Sciences, and Humanities Unit of the European Commission. In that role, he's responsible for socioeconomic science, humanities, and foresight research unit for the European Commission. Throughout his career, he has always been concerned by the policy dimension of horizontal domains, in particular energy, environment, and more recently social sciences. And has been, he's been involved in a number of foresight initiatives in these fields, and he's the author of several scientific and general papers.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I will not, uh, sorry, I will not enter in the scientific uh, substance, I will say, of sustainability, uh, but I will make a combination of uh, what we do in the sense that how we, we put this uh, uh, societal and uh, innovation issues in our policies in Europe. And also I will show you uh, what we do with the context of our future cooperation. Uh, I will start with something uh, which demonstrates uh, that we work already together, and I will finish also by seeing as this. Uh, it was in January 2010, and we had in Brussels and the US ambassador, and we, our hierarchy, and you recognize Mr. Baer, a meeting about mapping the future for the EU-US partnership, policy and research perspectives. It was in a large context, but you know, there will, it will be a follow-up of this. And of course, there is a link with our willingness to make this uh, US-EU summit. Um, second thing is, uh, this morning, Jean-Michel told you that we have Europe 2020 as a European uh, policy or strategy even. But uh, I insist on this because uh, what is important is that for the first time, for the first time, the European strategy is really based on three pillars, which are uh, both economic, social, and also environment, that means sustainability in more general terms. So um, this is new. This is new, but this is important also for the research and innovation strategy, because our driving force are, of course, the same are in alignment with the EU strategy. Now, I tell you something which is in relation with the question we had this morning. Uh, do we produce uh, forward uh, foresight studies uh, just uh, in the research? just for the pleasure to have a vision of the future, I would say no. This exercise which has been done, World in 2025, was used finally to better define the Europe 2020 strategy, which means that uh, the definition of such a strategy take, was taking into account the vision of uh, five years uh, later. And uh, that means this is important because it's the tradition now in the EU policies to do this. By the way, we were criticized to have limited this uh, vision to 2025. People said it was 2030, 2050 that you should have taken yeah, on board. Um, so don't forget these uh, three pillars, which are now the basis of the European Union on policy and, of course, driving for for us. Now, um, I give you some example which demonstrate this is not economic, uh, only economic oriented. Um, this is 3% uh, of GDP should be invested in R&D. I have noticed this morning that you were speaking of more than 3%. In Europe, we are at 1.9%, so top 2%. So that means the, the jump is uh, very big. 75% uh, of the population should be employed, which is not the case actually. We have targets for climate energy, which is a driving force, and uh, you know this 2020-20 in 2020 is not original, uh, is important, so that means 20 for energy efficiency, for efficiency, 20 is for renewables, and the other 20 is for reduction of uh, CO2 emissions. So this is an objective, and these objectives determine, you know, all the, in particular for the research, all the priorities for the, for the research. Also, the question of education, uh, which is important in uh, Europe and which has an importance also for the research, you will see why later. And po poverty, uh, of course, poverty is not uh, uh, is important uh, in Europe, not still marginal because we speak of 20 million, but you know, it's a reality that we have now to, to avoid. Now, um, the EU research in SSH, so in social science, the priority is just to show also how is integrated this societal and uh, sustainability issue. In few days, I ask you, if I may, 
uh, to have a look on the new communication which will be produced by the European Commission, which is called Innovation Union, and which will be now the direction of the European research in general. By the way, it's not only research, it's European research and innovation, because for the first time now in our story, we have research and innovation which are together, which was not the case in the past. And the second thing which is important, which is new, is that now this innovation union, so research and innovation program, is driven by societal challenges, which is also new. You know, you see the previous activity, it was very often just this, uh, the challenge was uh, how to improve knowledge, so to extend knowledge. Now this is societal challenge which are driving this uh, 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 research and innovation program. Have a look on this, it will be published and you will see uh, this aspect which is presented. The societal challenge which have been presented this morning by Mr. Aldrin are very similar to the societal challenge, which are also our driving force now. So that means there is a common, uh, common understanding, I would say. And um, this is also, you will see that this is also this is the first step to a so-called socio-ecological transition. So that means how to the economy to address also social and uh, ecologic dimension. And in this innovation union, another element which is new is that we have integrated social innovation. So it's not purely, uh, purely technological innovation, this is also social innovation, which is also absolutely new. Last element is the support to EU policies. If you, in social science, if you want to be, uh, because you address societal challenge, of course you have to help the, the social and societal policy. So that means, uh, particularly for us, we uh, make a lot of efforts. Some uh, success, I would say. Um, EU claims has been presented uh, by Mrs. Corrado before. It's important because productivity is well understood, and you have seen also that we make efforts that are to understood to understand it, uh, taking into account now this issue of innovation. Um, I will uh, be more explicit on the Demeter project because the Demeter project, we have two aspects, I think which are really important for also our future cooperation. One is how to understand better the, around the world this role of patents and uh, citations on innovation, how to understand this better. And, uh, you know, to explain also if uh, the spillovers, which are uh, according to the, the research and innovation and the impact of these spillovers. So that means this database is one part. The second part is that we measure with economic modeling, we measure the impact of research and innovation policies on the economy and on employment for all Europe. Um, another thing is intangible, but uh, I don't insist on this, but I will insist on the services, that means the whole of services innovation, which is also something important that we want to invest to, and to understand better. Forward-looking activities, uh, including at sectoral level, well in 2025 is one example, the other example was presented by uh, Mr. Chateau. And uh, what we do is also to develop databases for the world, so that means the willingness to develop infrastructures on social data and economic data, I think is important and perhaps could be a subject of collaboration uh, because at the end, what was said by my colleague, at the end there is a trace of this. This is a concrete, uh, concrete outcome of a cooperation and useful. Demeter, I come back on Demeter just to show you about the, what we did on citations. Uh, we see very well on this graphic the respective role of uh, Europe, USA, and Asia. And what you observe is that, okay, Europe uh, now has a little more than the US, uh, but Asia now is at the same, more or less, becomes at the same level. So that means Asia Pacific's rise has been profound. And you know, this thing is important. Uh, citation is important just not to know uh, what is the knowledge according to the regions, but because there is an impact. Uh, on innovation and on the spillovers. So that means uh, second, uh, second uh, style or second type of analysis we do 
is this impact, uh, uh, this impact you know, of uh, the 3% of GDP, as we say, on our economies. On the first and the top, the line, this is what could happen or what is the scenario if no crisis appeared. The second one is that the crisis and what could happen if we have a normal, you say, normal trends, business as usual scenario with the crisis is uh, below, the line below in red. And the, at the middle of this is just what happens is Europe is investing 3% GDP in research and innovation. And you see that half of the gap that we would have if nothing is done, half of the gap could be covered by research and innovation uh, impacts. So, which means this is, uh, of course, important results, and uh, you can see uh, the advantage in concrete terms. So, the three percent of GDP, we know how many billion, and we know how many billion, and this is six times the investment of research, which is, uh, which is provided by this. So, factor of six multiplication. Um, now, what are the transitions that we are addressing? Um, so that means it's clear that uh, research and innovation, we have to address also, uh, research, sorry, we have to address education and innovation. In Europe, it's done, but not really done. And uh, for this reason, now, uh, we want to put this on this, uh, on this agenda. In particular, because in Europe we have created this European Innovation Technology Institute. In Europe there is another institute, which is in Budapest, and which will play normally a crucial role uh, in terms of uh, education and, and skills, and skills uh, which are in favor of uh, better, uh, better innovation and better, you know, uh, knowledge, increasing the knowledge and innovation. And uh, have this in mind, I think uh, this is a uh, new thing. In this context also, uh, what we want to do in, the, in, this, uh, in this area is to address this issue of green jobs. So that means because the skills, if the skills are obtained, of course, uh, you, you can uh, have a better chance to, to have uh, success. The case is eco-innovation, as I said this morning, where there is a need really for, for skills. Um, after this, we have uh, another thing is from innovation in manufacturing to innovation is also in services and social innovation. This is at the heart of our program. So that means uh, the next days. And uh, we, we will discuss with Bob, I will think, I think that we will discuss of this in a, a future partnership if we, could, uh, if we could insist on this. Tangible and intangible growth factor, uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, we'll do. You know, from the tangible, uh, from the tangible uh, factors, growth factors, what we try to see is that what happens if uh, finally there is uh, no uh, efforts in European in, uh, investment in terms of research, we call this the cost of non-innovation, and this is an exercise that uh, we do. We also try to address the uh, uh, spillover issue, and what we have now calculated is that finally the, the, the impact of spillovers on the growth explained on the growth according to the, I would say the added growth due to the research and innovation impact is explained by spillover at the level of 60%, so which means, you know, is absolutely important. Um, now, another uh, element is from US, EU, Japan science to worldwide research, so that means we have to address this issue and we try to do it, so that means it's not only these three uh, continents which are doing research, the others are doing research, you have seen the Asia impact and we have to understand this and to anticipate what will happen. So from competition in products, and this is an issue to compact to a competition to attract knowledge investment and knowledge workers uh, is also an issue for research and that we try to overcome. So now, uh, now this is a, just to draw your attention, and I finish with US collaboration as you see, that we now, now we have a call for proposal for research, which is open until February 2011, and U.S. can participate. U.S. can participate within uh, within part within a consortium with European teams, 
And you have seen that in this call for proposals, we have really indicated things which are the subject of this meeting today and the, the partnership. So Europe moving towards a new path for economic growth and social development, this is sustainability. So that means not only economic, sustainability issue. New innovation processes, including social innovation, this is also uh, this, uh, the interest of this, uh, of this meeting. And uh, to see, in particular, for social innovation, how to measure social innovation, how to scale up innovation, how to ensure that uh, you know uh, also the private uh, is interested by to invest in social investment, how to make the regulation to improve this is part of this thing. new innovation process is to see how new innovation what could be has, what could be the impacts on the always economic and uh, employment, economic growth and employment. The last but not least, this is uh, the first, it was the first uh, slide that I have shown, is transatlantic relation is the context of global governance and relationship with other powers is something open and of course uh, it could create an interest, uh, an interest for you. So to conclude, um, to conclude, there is a future for EU-US uh, C cooperation, and thank you for your attention. Well, we're a little bit over time, but not hopelessly so. So maybe we can have just a very few questions, and then uh, we will close. Michael Lubell with the American Physical Society and CCNY, and this question for Monsieur Vallette. You showed a graph of projected economic growth, uh, changing from the 1.9 percent of uh, GDP investment in R&D to 3 percent. I would like to know what modeling you're using for the uh, change in the um, in the growth rate with the increase in uh, uh, R&D spending and whether you take into account any possible policy changes that might accompany that uh, increase from 1.9 to 3. Yes. So um, it can be a long answer, but I will be short. First, this is an econometric model uh, in which endogenous growth has been represented. So that means the link, you know, this over these uh, spillovers, for example, uh, this leverage effect, all these things are represented and are estimated uh, in the economic way. So the idea was uh, now to, 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 to see, uh, to answer pre more precisely to your questions. So this uh, additional amount from 1.9 to 3 percent um, was uh, the, the coming of the the income to finance this difference, because this is, it was your question, uh, was explained by the behavior of industries, which were which was uh, able to do this at the detriment of other expenditures. So that means uh, they prefer to do this. And also, uh, it was uh, including in terms of the public part, so that means public support for EU, uh, one part was also at the detriment for other, for compared to other policies. But it was simulation, so that means it was not, you know, uh, uh, it was not, uh, I would say, a political decision which was behind. It was just tests about different assumptions. So it was the main. Uh, and another element, it was bottom up, so that means it was modeling for each country, and by aggregation we obtained the EU. Other remark, uh, the link with other big countries was also in including, so that means the uh, effort. Emilio Mendez from Brookhaven National Laboratory. It's a follow-up to that question. Why 3%? If R&D produces economic growth, why not make it 4% or 5% or 2.5%? <laughs> but, you know, 3%, to come back to the previous question, to find the difference of 1.1% is so difficult already, so that means because you have a card in your face. Uh, but 3% is judged now as even too much optimistic. So that means many people say we will never 
reached uh, 3 percent in Europe in 2020. And uh, okay, this is why in the assumptions this is not uh, three percent now. This is three percent in 2016, and after after the same. No, it's not easy to achieve three percent <laughs> because our country are, have a debt now. So that means to speak of this three percent now is not very welcome in Europe. But we demonstrate it can be an effort. By the way, uh, you know, there is, if you go on the website, if you are interested by this type of question, uh, we have a website on social science uh, program, and we have just put on this all the details of the results and assumption. And we did it for two exercises. The first is 3% of GDP, and another one is what happens if we invest 10 million, because we have just invest, invested 10 billions now. So what is the impact of this as considered as a shock? What, what is the direct and short-term impact? This is long-term impact. So you have all the results which are presented on our side. Okay, one more, and then I think probably we should wrap things up. Uh, Bob Icord from USAID. Um, this is, I guess, for both Michael and, and Marilyn. Um, hasn't been a lot of discussion about uh, pricing and tariff policies today. Uh, but I mean, there is obviously a very close link between that and innovation, modernization, investment, et cetera. And I think that it relates to both, Marilyn, to some of the things you were saying about, you know, how can we get these basic energy efficiency investments done in the U.S.? And Michael, I think it, it, it relates to what you were saying with regards to how can we develop the basis for expanding uh, the systems to serve more and more of the population as well as, uh, as, well as meet the needs of urbanization, et cetera. So I, I would like any comments that you had on that. I mean, I think that um, one of the concerns I have, Michael, is that in the discussion about climate change and um, subsidies that, um, that there is uh, often a sort of uh, – an undervalue uh, uh, of the rationalization of tariffs and that we historically in AID has worked with the bank and the IMF to try to ensure that. And I think that um, uh, are we, are we, is the bank still going to give priority to that or are we going to get caught up in these discussions about feed-in tariffs and, and other kinds of financing of options that may not meet the test of cost recovery? Well, I actually wanted to um, segue from your feed-in tariffs to import tariffs <laughs> because I saw a very good presentation that Peter Evans, who's the head of strategic planning at GE, gave just a week ago where he – it's the first time I'd seen country-by-country country itemization of import tariffs for different clean energy technologies. And they range from generally about 1.3-something uh, percent for the U.S. This is for solar and wind turbines as well as high-efficiency gas turbines to about 20 percent for countries like Russia, India, um, and Europe was in the 2 to 3 percent range. And that incredible spread, I think, merits some discussion. It's a little bit out of my domain. However, I um, um, think that it is a significant disadvantage that U.S. companies face when they are uh, confronting that level of import tariff into countries like Russia and India, who are are pretty good partners uh, otherwise <laughs> with us. Well, on that subject, it just happens that the whole series of reports are being prepared by the folks in our East Asia region for APEC, including a discussion about how the Asia-Pacific region needs to get its act together on those tariffs if it really wants to embrace a, a greater usage in its own countries of, of clean energy. So you're absolutely right, and I hope that the bank will – contribute to bringing that to light, as I hope it will continue to do when it comes to the need for basic energy tariff and other price rationalization. I certainly didn't want to or mean to suggest that that was not important. In fact, if anything, I have somewhat the same concern that you've expressed. We seem to have sometimes become the International Bank for Reconstruction 
and dioxides of carbon reduction. Um, and climate change has its place, but I think we have not been consistent in the way we've addressed the need for sensible energy infrastructure investment and management and also, you know, cost recovery. You know better than I do some of the interesting experiences in the past where people have become a little too infatuated with a particular kind of approach. Um, we definitely need to learn from a lot of mistakes to figure out how this extraordinary infrastructure deficit that is holding back growth in so many places can be overcome, and that's going to require both economically efficient decisions and financially sustainable decisions. So I, I don't want to speak directly to what the bank's doing in this now for fear that I might end up admitting that maybe it's doing too little. But I certainly hope that as it moves into a new focus on infrastructure, that doesn't just sort of go away when the financial crisis starts to abate and it no longer seems like a important, you know, pump priming tool and that will re-engage in you know, getting serious about this. All I wanted to suggest was that to overcome these political economy problems and get these good ideas to actually work, including you know, many, many good things that AID has done in this area in the past, we're also going to have to think about ways to overcome those barriers. And um, we can't build it and hope they'll come with tariff reform any more than we can with you know, hard infrastructure, I think. We're seeing a lot of interest in feed-in tariffs in the U.S. It's hot, hotly debated across states and cities. In fact, we have Gainesville, Florida, a public utility implementing feed-in tariffs. You know, in the absence of a national renewable electricity standard and some other strong national policies, it's not surprising that we can learn a lot from what countries around the world have um, done in the design of feed-in tariffs, and um, we're seeing a lot of interest in implementing them here. It's not not all bad. Well, on that note, I think we'll, we'll wrap this up and conclude the uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. Not all bad. So, thank you. It's been a long day, and I imagine you wish I were standing on top of the bar delivering this, but <laughs> I will keep it brief. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe you wouldn't want me on top of the bar. Uh, <laughs> I have been on top of the bar in the past, but uh, the, uh, I want to start by thanking a few people, and then I want to talk about um, uh, the upcoming year. <clears throat> uh, I first, I, I'd like to thank the NSF, specifically the Chemistry Division, the Office of Science at DOE, and the European Commission. I'd like to thank the organizing committee, who really are the people responsible for putting this whole, whole thing together. That would include Kent Hughes, Jim Roberto, Cherry, um, Kent Hughes of the Wilson Center, Jim Roberto of Oak Ridge, Cherry Murray of Harvard, Paul Piercy of Wisconsin, Marilyn Brown at Georgia Tech, Pierre Vallette at the European Commission, and David Green of Oak Ridge and the Baker Center. Uh, I'd also like to thank a few people who work today and, and did a lot of the background work on this. One is Christine uh, Reiser, Christ, Christina Reiser. Christina is my, she's a PhD student in the economics department and also has the unfortunate uh, <coughs> occupation as my research assistant. Uh, she, she wrote the uh, background paper, the, I've got terrible allergies, and you're going to have to excuse me. Uh, Christ Christina wrote the background paper that was sent to all of the participants, and um, <clears throat> she will be writing a report on this meeting, and she'll be doing some other things I'll talk about in a moment. 
I also like to thank Clark Taylor of the Wilson Center, Liz Byers, um, Michael Darden, Wesley Melillo, and they they are all of the Wilson Center. Uh, Clark Taylor kind of had the hotline. You know, he was used to getting these calls from me where there was heavy breathing on the other side because I was in a state of panic and fortunately he evidently doesn't have caller ID. Um, and, and I'm not sure. Missy Jenkins from the Baker Center. Missy coordinates all the meetings uh, at the Baker Center as well as off-site meetings. <clears throat> I'm terribly sorry. I was dragging around a bottle of water here a minute ago. Okay, so let me, and, and also I want to thank all the panelists and I want to thank our keynote speakers. Ah, oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> I want to hear me clear my throat in this microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to thank all the panelists and the keynote speakers. Uh, I know the organizing committee feels that uh, it, it was really a spectacular day for us, but uh, I, I hope for you too. Special thanks go to our, our EU colleagues who made a special effort to be here. It wasn't easy flying across the Atlantic, but uh, they uh, contributed a lot to this, both in terms of its development and in terms of what happened today. There are four workshops scheduled. This is a year-long event. This is the kickoff event. There are four workshops scheduled after this. One on energy, who Paul Piercy will be chairing that. That will be a workshop at the Baker Center. There will be an environmental workshop held here at the Wilson Center. Jeff DeBelco will lead that effort. This will be a committee consisting of Americans as well as Euro <clears throat> Europeans. There will be two workshops held in Europe. Uh, the, the, both of these workshops will be on innovation. The kind of subtitles to the innovation workshops will be uh, what are the drivers for innovation and what are the conditions that are necessary to have successful innovation. Very important topics. Uh, I, I've had a lot of inquiries uh, about these workshops in Europe and I'll try to describe them and they say, no, no, Bob, where are they being held? But um, we do, they haven't been, locations have not been identified for the European workshops. There will also be a final summit meeting held somewhere in Europe in approximately one year which will discuss the results of the ongoing dialogue. But there are also other workshops uh, we are talking about. Uh, th these are just in the formation stage, so I, I can't say too much about them, but there will be perhaps other workshops dealing with this topic. Uh, to engage you better, we're gonna set up a workshop, I mean a, a web page. Uh, Christina will be involved in setting this up. Uh, I guess in the modern terminology, this is called a blog, but she will be uh, the blog manager. But we really wanna hear from you. We want to hear, we will be posting everything that develops in this on this web page. We will also be posting today's presentations, by the way, on, on the web page. We will be linked to the Wilson Center for they are 
uh, will also have some material relevant to this. And so we will have probably more information than you can uh, digest, uh, but we will want to keep you informed. And we also want your ideas. We would love to have your ideas about, you know, the agenda was so crowded and we really had hoped to have more discussion time. But, but it, it just, but we were constrained also wanting to have this as a one day event and not impose it two days uh, on folks, which would have given us more dis discussion time, but it would have been a time killer for you. So we've constrained it, but, but we do want to hear from you on this blog, and there will be ample opportunity for you to give us your input, uh, give us your ideas, and we will be communicating to you because we have your emails. And so we will be sending you additional information, but we assume you're interested by the fact that um, that you stuck it out. <laughs> you know, the linen used to be called something like old iron seat or something to that effect. So I assume you all deserve that award, the linen award. But anyway, I'm here now. I can give, tell you why I'm really up here. I'm really up here to point you across the hallway to the bar, and there will be a reception and some alcohol. <laughs>